process of making a protein from its genetic instructions may seem really complicated, but it's a piece of cake. At least it's like making a cake. So I like to think of the central dogma, so where you go from DNA to RNA to protein, I like to think of it as making a cake um, from a cake recipe. So your cake recipe would be the gene, um, and then you make copies of that, messenger RNA copies, and then you make your protein from that, your cake. Um, and so here's a basic just how I think about things and various levels of regulation and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, so let's go to the bakery. So say your cell wants to make a specific protein. The instructions for making that protein are really, really precious because if you mess with those, well, then you make mutated proteins every time you want to make that protein. And so the instructions, like the permanent instructions, the original copy, that DNA gene, that is going to be stored tightly um, in a protected compartment of your cell, the nucleus. And so you can think of it kind of like a restriction section of the library, like where they have their references where you can't actually check out the dictionary from the library, but you can make copies of the pages. Similarly, your cells can make copies of this permanent recipe of that DNA gene. They can make copies of it in the form of RNA. Um, so it's really similar to DNA. It's got slightly different chemical properties. Um, and it can be regulated and degraded more easily. And importantly, it can get taken out of that central nucleus into the cells um, to, or into the cytoplasm, so the general interior of the cell where the protein making machinery can use it. Make, having this DNA to RNA um, and this RNA form that we, is messenger RNA um, because it holds the message from the DNA to the protein um, that holds the instructions for making the protein. Having this step of actually going from DNA to the messenger RNA um, before you go to the protein, it offers opportunities both for regulation um, in terms of how many copies of that RNA you want to make. So you only have that one dictionary, but you can make tons and tons of copies of the page. You only have that one cookbook, but you can make tons and tons of copies of the recipe. And you can make like differential copies. So in the cookbook, like there's one copy of every recipe, but say it is like, I don't know, it's summer and you're not gonna make the hot soup, you wanna make like the cold salad or whatever. You would have multiple, you would wanna make more copies of the things that you want then. And so having this amplification step at the messenger RNA is helpful for that. It also, as we see, is, or we'll see is going to offer some really cool opportunities in the form of how we process it. Um, we can process it in different ways to get different products. It's like if you had a cake recipe, that for a three layer cake, you can make a one layer cake, you can make a two layer cake, or you can make a three layer cake. Um, and so we'll see something called alternative splicing that's going to allow us to differentially regulate um, different versions of the protein and make different versions of it based on that same original recipe. So those are some of the key benefits of having this like mRNA intermediary. Um, Okay, so let's go into a little more detail. Um, and of course, then so also you can regulate how much of that protein is actually made from those messenger RNA copies. And so you have levels of regulation at every step of this pro process. So how many of the messenger RNA copies do you want to make? And this process is called transcription when we make the messenger RNA um, because we're transcribing from DNA to RNA, which are both in this like nucleic acid language. And then later we're gonna translate it into protein. So we're gonna go from that nucleic acid language, the language of DNA and RNA into the amino acid language of protein. So but then we call that step translation. And that happens um, using these ribosome complexes, which are out here in the cytoplasm, which is why we have to like export that mRNA out of the nucleus, which is good because we want to keep all that those original copies safe in this nucleus. And notice I'm saying like original copies, um, as they're super duper precious, and they are, but they're really precious for that cell and for any cells that are made from that cell. So we have what we call like germ cells, which are the cells of like your sperm or your eggs, which can actually go on to make other people. Um, and then we also have somatic cells, which are the cells that just like in our skin and our organs, all of the cells like in the rest of our body. And so those cells can be really important, especially if they're like stem cells, um, that because then they can be used to make lots of the cells. And so then each of those cells would have the mutations that were caused if you had a mutation to that DNA. But it's not going to affect like all of the cells in your body. 
But if you have a mutation that causes a growth advantage or something, that's how you can get things like cancer to occur. So the DNA is really, really precious. Not that the mRNA is not important, it is, um, but if we mess up a messenger RNA copy, that's a lot less deleterious than messing up the actual DNA. So that's another benefit of having this locked up form. Okay, so we have this general like central dogma where we take the recipe, we make these messenger RNA copies of it in this process called transcription, and then we make protein from that in this process called translation. And then, but there's all these like um, these opportunities for regulation at these various steps. Um, and so we can regulate the, tra the, the transcriptions of the level of making the messenger RNA copies. How many copies do we want to make? Turns out that the DNA is actually really, although we drop it, seems like it's all, I don't know, simple. This DNA is really wound up around these because there's a ton of ton of DNA. You basically have to wind it up in order to condense it into a form that can actually hold, store it in that cell, in that nucleus. And so it's coiled up really tightly um, along these proteins, called, uh, around these proteins called histones and these little like bead-like things called nucleosomes. Um, and then these are kind of like hiding parts of the DNA. And so it's like hiding very, it's like certain recipes are like redacted. And if you want to unredact them, then you have to move those nucleosomes out of the way. And so you can have all sorts of regulation by modifying those histone proteins, various things like that to move things out of the way so that you can have that transcription occur. And so this is the level of transcriptional regulation. How many copies of that messenger RNA are you going to make? Then you have various forms of post transcriptional regulation. Um, so, how long is that messenger RNA going to stick around? Um, we'll also talk about how we can process it in different ways. So, we'll get back to the whole alternative splicing thing in a minute. Um, but so we can make different levels of copies and then we can keep them around or not keep them around. Um, then we can make lots of protein from them or not make lots of protein from them. Um, so, there are various levels which we can control things um, post-transcriptionally, and we can also control things post-translationally. So once you make that protein, um, you can modify it, you can degrade it, various things like that. And so we have there are lots of different ways that you can measure the various levels of transcription by measuring the amounts of trans or the various like levels of expression um, by measuring transcription, translation, post-translation, all modifications, all of these various things. So more on that in other posts. Um, but let's get back to this whole idea of alternative splicing and splicing in general. So splicing is basically the process where we go from the like the word to word, the letter to letter um, copy of the recipe in the messenger RNA, the pre-messenger RNA, and mature it into this mature messenger RNA form. And in order to really mature it, what I mean is we have to kind of remove a bunch of regions. These regions called introns. So basically in the DNA um, and in the original pre-messenger RNA that's made from the DNA, you're going to have both regions that you want to keep in the final recipe as well as regions that you want to cut out. Um, so the regions that you keep in are called exons and the regions that you cut out are called introns. They're like interrupting the different exons. The exons have the things that are going to be expressed. Um, although at five prime and three prime ends, they have untranslated regions. So typically when we think about expression, we're thinking about, okay, those are the protein coding regions, the regions that actually have the instructions for making the protein. So in this case, it would be like the instructions for making a chocolate layer of the cake and the instructions for making a strawberry layer of the cake and the instructions for making a vanilla layer of the cake. Those would be like different exons. But then in between them, you have some like regulatory nodes. And so these are kind of like margin nodes or um, interrupting pages in your cookbook. And you might have important information on those pages. Maybe you're sketching out some things like, oh, dad, make this one then when you want to do this, or make this one, I don't know, various regulatory nodes. Um, so these are like your introns. And these introns, though, if the if the translating machinery, if the ribosomes um, were to go and try to actually make a protein from that, it would read like gibberish. And so instead, what has to happen is that those regions have to get cut out. And this happens in this process called splicing. And splicing offers this cool opportunity where you can splice it in different ways and what we call alternative splicing. And this allows you to make different versions of the protein. Um, and so like diff making different versions of that cake from the same recipe. Um, and so this is a really cool thing. 
about having that um, step where you're going from this pre-messenger RNA to the mature messenger RNA. So I mentioned you also have those parts that aren't actually like making proteins, these untranslated regions. So remember, translation is the part that actually you make the protein from it. But there's a little regulatory information that gets left on this five prime and three prime end, um, these untranslated regions. These are gonna offer more room for regulation. Um, room for the ribosomes to get started, as well as room for thing, regulation through things like microRNA mediated regulation or interference, um, which is what I studied in grad school, and so I have much more on that in other posts. Um, but yeah, and it also gets like a cap and a tail, and this is going to help with the processing as well as give it kind of like it's to get out of the nucleus, because remember, this has to get out of the nucleus so that it can meet those um, ribosomal chefs. So that's the basics of baking a protein. Um, and so hope that helps you understand the process. And um, there's lots more if you want to know more about the details and other posts that I've done.